This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 10. Reformer and Politician Who is the reformer, and what does he propose? The reformer wants to reform and improve. He is not sure what it is that he really wants to change. Sometimes he says that people are bad, and it is them that he wants to reform. At other times, he means to improve conditions. He does not believe in abolishing evil altogether. Doing away with something that is rotten is too radical for him. For heaven's sake, he cautions you, don't be too hasty. He wants to change things gradually, little by little. Take war, for example. War is bad, of course, the reformer admits. It is wholesale murder, a blot upon our civilization. But abolish it? Oh no, he wants to reform it. He wants to limit armaments, for instance. With less armaments, he says, we'll kill fewer people. He wants to humanize war. To make slaughter more decent, so to speak. If you should carry out his ideas in your personal life, you would not have a rotten tooth that aches pulled out all at once. You would have it pulled out a little today, some more next week, for several months or years, and by then you would be ready to pull it out altogether, so that it would not, should not hurt so much. That is the logic of the reformer. Don't be too hasty. Don't pull out a bad tooth all at once. The reformer thinks he can make people better by law. Pass a new law, he says, whenever anything goes wrong. Compel men to be good. He forgets that for hundreds and even thousands of years, laws have been made to force people to be good. Yet human nature remains what it always was. We have so many laws that even the proverbial Philadelphia lawyer is lost in their maze. The ordinary person can't tell anymore what is right or wrong according to statute, what is just, what is true or false. A special class of persons, judges, decide what is honest or dishonest, when it is permitted to, be, to steal, and in what manner when fraud is legal and when it is not, when murder is right and when it is a crime, which uniform entitled, entitles you to kill and which does not. It takes many laws to determine all of this, and for centuries legislators have been busy making laws at a good salary, and yet today we still need more laws for all the other ones that have failed to make you good. Still the lawmaker continues to compel people to be good, if existing laws have not made you better, he says, then we need more and stricter ones. Stiffer sentences will diminish and prevent crime, he claims, while he appeals in behalf of his reform to the very men who have stolen the earth from the people. If someone has killed another in a business quarrel for money or other advantage, the reformer will not admit that money and money-getting rouse the worst passions and drive men to commit crime and murder. He will argue that the willful taking of human life deserves capital punishment, and he will straightway help the government send armed men to some foreign country to do wholesale killing there. The reformer cannot think straight. He does not understand that if men act badly, it is because they think that it is, it is to their advantage to do so. The reformer says that a new law will change all that. He is a born prohibitionist. He wants to prohibit men from being bad. If a man lost his job, for instance, feels blue about it, and gets drunk to forget his troubles, the reformer wouldn't think of helping the man to find work. No, it is his drinking that must be prohibited, he insists. He thinks he has reformed you by driving you out of the saloon into the cellar where you stealthily slush vile moonshine instead of openly taking a drink. In the same way, he wants to reform you in what you eat and do in what you think and feel. He refuses to see that his reforms create worse evils than those they are supposed to suppress, that they cause more deceit, corruption, and vice. He puts one set of men to spy upon another, and he thinks that he has raised the standard of morality. He pretends to have made you better by compelling you to be a hypocrite. I don't mean to detain you long with the reformer. We are going to meet him again as a politician. Without wishing to be rough on him, I can frankly say that when the reformer is honest, he is a fool. 
When he is a politician, he is a knave. In either case, as we shall presently see, he cannot solve our problem of how to make a, the world a better place to live in. The politician is the first cousin of the reformer. Pass a new law, says the reformer, and compel men to be good. Let me pass the law, says the politician, and things will be better. You can tell the politician by his talk. In most cases, he is a grafter who wants to climb on your shoulders to power. Once there, he forgets his solemn promises and only thinks of his ambitions and interests. When the politician is honest, he misleads you no less than the grafter. Perhaps worse, because you put your confidence in him and are the more d disappointed when he fails to do you any good. The reformer and the politician are both on the wrong track. To try to change men by law is just like trying to change your face by getting a new mirror. For men to make laws, not laws men. The law merely reflects men as they are, as the mirror reflects your, pe your features. But the law keeps people from becoming criminals, reformer and politician assert. If that is true, if law really prevents crime, then the more laws the better. By the time you have passed enough laws, there will be no more crime. Well, why do you smile? Because you know that is nonsense. You know that the best law can do is punish crime. It cannot prevent it. Should the time ever come when the law could read a man's mind and detect his intention to commit crime, then it might prevent it. But in that case, the law would have no policemen to do the preventing, because they'd be in prison themselves, and the administration of law would be honest and impartial. There would be neither judges nor lawmakers, because they would be keeping the police company. But seriously speaking, as things stand, how can the law prevent crime? It can only do so when the intention to commit a crime has been announced or has been somehow known. But such cases are very rare. One does not advertise his criminal plans. The claim, then, that law prevents crime is entirely baseless. But the fear of punishment, you object. Does it not prevent crime? If that were the case, crime would have stopped long ago, for surely the law has done enough punishing. The whole experience of mankind disproves the idea that punishment prevents crime. On the contrary, it has been found that even the most severe punishments do not frighten people away from crime. England, as well as other countries, used to punish not only murder but scores of lesser crimes with death yet it did not to deter others from committing the same crimes. People were then pu executed publicly by hanging, by garroting, by the guillotine, in order to, to inspire greater fear. Yet even the most fearful punishment failed to prevent or diminish crime. It was found that public ex executions had a brutalizing effect upon the people, and that there are cases on record where persons who witnessed an execution immediately committed the very terrible punishment of which they had just witnessed. That is why public execution was abolished. It did more harm than good. Statistics show that there has been no increase in crime in the countries that have done away entirely with capital punishment. Of course, there may be some cases in which fear of punishment prevents a crime, but on the whole, its only effect is to make crime more circumspect, so that its detection is more difficult. There are, generally speaking, two types of crime, some committed in the heat of anger and passion, and such cases one does not stop to consider the consequences, and so the fear of punishment does not enter, enter as a factor. The other class of crime is committed with cold deliberation, most professionally, and in such cases, fear of punishment only serves to make the criminal more careful to leave, more, to leave no traces. It is a well-known trait of the professional criminal that he thinks himself sufficiently clever to avoid detection, no matter how often he happens to be caught. He will always blame some particular circumstance, some accidental cause, or just bad luck for having been arrested. Next time I'll be more careful, he says or I won't trust my pal anymore. But almost never will you find in him the faintest thought of giving up on crime on account of the punishment which may be meted out to him. I have known thousands of criminals, 
yet hardly any of them ever took possible punishment into consideration. It is just because fear of punishment has no deterrent effect that crime continues in spite of laws and courts, prisons and executions. But let us suppose that punishment does have some deterring effect. Must there not be powerful reasons that cause people to commit crime, notwithstanding all the dire punishment inflicted? What are the reasons? Every prison warden will tell you that whenever there is much unemployment, hard times, the prisons get filled. The fact is also borne out by investigation into the causes of crime. The greatest percentage of it is due directly to conditions, to industrial and economic reasons. That is why the vast majority of prison population comes from the poor classes. It has been established that poverty and unemployment, with their attendant misery and despair, are the chief sources of crime. Is there any law to prevent poverty and, un un and unemployment? Is there any law to abolish these main causes of crime? Are not all the laws designed to keep up the conditions which produce poverty and misery and thus manufacture crime all the time? Suppose a pipe burst in your house. You put a bucket under the brake to catch the escaping water. You keep putting buckets there, but as long as you do not mend the broken pipe, the leakage will continue, no matter how much you may swear about it. Our prisons are the buckets. Pass as many laws as you want. Punish the criminals as you may, the leakage will continue until you, re until you repair the broken social pipe. I have said that most crime is of an economic nature, that is, it has to do with money, with possession, with desire to get something with the least effort, to secure a living or wealth by hook or crook. But that is the ambition of our whole life, of our entire civilization. As long as our existence is based on a spirit of this sort, will it be possible to eradicate crime? As long as society is built upon the principle of grabbing all that you can, we must continue to live that way. Some will try to do it within the law. Others, more courageous, reckless, or desperate, will do it outside the law. But one and the other will really be doing the same thing. And it's the thing that is the crime, not the manner in which it is done. Those who can do it within the law call the others criminals. It's for the illegal criminals, and those who might become such, that most of the laws are made. The illegal criminals are often caught. Their conviction and punishment depend mainly on how successful they have been in their criminal career. The more successful, the less chance of their conviction, the lighter their punishment. It is not the crime they have committed which will ultimately decide their fate but their ability to employ expensive lawyers, and their political and social connections, their money and influence. It will generally be the poor and friendless fellow who will be made to feel the full weight of the law. He'll get speedy justice, and the heaviest penalty. He is not able to take advantage of the various delays which our law affords to richer fellow criminals. For appeals to the higher courts which are expensive luxuries, which the moneyless cannot indulge in. That is why you almost never see a rich man behind bars. Such are occasion occasionally found guilty, but mighty seldom punished. Nor will you find many professional criminals in prison. These know the ropes. They have friends and connections. Usually they also have fall money just for such occasions with which to oil their way out of the legal meshes. Those you find in prisons and penitentiaries are the poorest of society, accidental criminals, mostly working men and farm boys, from whom poverty and misfortune, striking and picketing, unemployment and general helplessness have brought behind the bars. So our social merry-go-round revolves, and all the time the conditions that had made those unfortunates into criminals continue manufacturing new crops of them and law and order goes on as before, and the reformer and the politician keep making more laws. It is a profitable business, this lawmaking. Have you ever stopped to consider whether the courts, the police, 
the whole machinery of this so-called justice, really want to abolish crime? It is, is it in the interest of the policeman, the detective, the sheriff, the judge, the lawyer, the prison contractors, wardens, deputies, keepers, and thousands of others who live by the administration of justice to do away with crime? Supposing there were no criminals, could those administrators hold their jobs? Could you be taxed for their support? Would they not have to do some honest work? Think it over and see if crime is not a more lucrative source of income to the dispensers of justice than it is to the criminals themselves. Can you reasonably believe they want to abolish crime? Their business is to apprehend and punish the criminal, but it is not their in interest to do away with crime, for that's their bread and butter. That is, the reason why they will not look into the causes of crime. They are quite satisfied with things the way they are. They are the staunchest defenders of the existing system of justice and punishment the champions of law and order. They catch and punish criminals, but they leave crime and its causes severely alone. But what of the law for thee, you demand? The law is to keep up existing conditions, to preserve law and order. More laws are constantly made, all for the same purpose of defending and sus sustaining the present order of things, to for men, as the reformer says, to improve conditions, as the politician assures you. But the new laws leave men as they are, and conditions remain on the whole the same. Since capitalism and wage slavery began, millions of laws have been passed, but capitalism and wage slavery remain. The truth is, all the laws serve only to make capitalism stronger and perpetuate the workers' subjugation. It is the business of the politician, the science of politics, to make you believe that the law protects you and your interests, while it merely serves to keep up the system which robs, dupes, and enslaves you in body and mind. All the institutions of society have this one object in view, to instill in you a respect for law and government, to awe you with its authority and sanctity and thus support the social framework which rests upon your ignorance and your obedience. The whole secret thing is that the masters want to keep their stolen possessions. Law and government are the means by which they do it. There is no great mystery about this matter of government and laws, nor is there anything sacred or holy about them. Laws are made and unmade, old laws are abolished, and new laws are passed. It is the work of men, human, and therefore fallible and temporary. There is nothing eternal or unchangeable about them. But whatever laws you make, and however you change them, they always serve one purpose, to compel people to do certain things, to restrain them or punish them from doing other things. That is to say, the only purpose of laws and government is to rule people, to keep them from doing what they want, and prescribe them to what certain other people want them to do. But why must people be kept from doing what they want, and what, it is, and what is it that they want to do? If you look into this, you will find that people want to live, to satisfy their needs, to enjoy life. But if people are to be prevented from living and enjoying their lives, then there must be some amongst us who have an interest in doing that. So it is a fact. There are indeed people who don't want us to live and enjoy life because they have taken the joy out of our lives and they don't want to give it back to us. Capitalism has done it and the government which serves capitalism. To let people enjoy life would mean to stop robbing and oppressing them. That is why capitalism needs government. That is why we are taught to respect the sanctity of law. Why have we have been made to believe that breaking the law is criminal, though law-breaking and crime are often entirely different things? We have been made to believe that any act against the law is bad for society, though it may only be bad for the masters and the exploiters. We have been made to believe that everything which threatens our, the possessions of the rich is evil and wrong, 
and that everything which weakens our chains and destroys our slavery is criminal. In short, there has been developed in the course of time a kind of morality that is useful to the rulers and masters only, a class morality, really a slave morality, because it helps keep us in slavery. And whoever goes against this slave morality is called bad, immoral, a criminal, an anarchist. If I should rob you of all that you have, and then persuade you that what I did is good for you, and that you should guard my booty against others, it would be a very clever trick on my part, wouldn't it? It would secure me in my stolen possessions. Suppose further that I should also manage to convince you that we must make a rule that no one may touch my stolen wealth, and that I may continue to accumulate more in the same manner, and that the arrangement is just and to your own best interests. If such a crazy scheme should actually be carried out, then we'd have the law and order of government and capitalism that which we have today. It is clear, of course, that laws would have no force if the people did not believe in them and did not obey them. So the first thing to do is make them believe that laws are necessary and that they are good for them. And it is still better if you can lead them to think that it is they themselves who make the laws. Then they will be willing and anxious to obey them. That's what is called democracy, to get people to believe that they are their own rulers and that they themselves pass the laws of their country. That's the great advantage that a democracy or a republic has over a monarchy. In olden times, the business of ruling and robbing people was much harder and more dangerous. The king or feudal lord had to commit people by force to serve him. He would hire armed bands to make his subjects submit and pay tribute to him. That was expensive and troublesome. A better way was found by educating the populace to believe that they owe the king their loyalty and faithful service. Governing then came became much easier, but still people knew that the king was their lord and commander. A republic, however, is much safer and more comfortable for the rulers, for their people now imagine that they themselves are the masters. And no matter how exploited and oppressed they are, in a democracy, they think themselves free and independent. That is why the average working man in the United States, for instance, considers himself a sovereign citizen, though he has no more say about the ruling of his country than the starved peasant in Russia under the Tsar. He thinks he is free, while in fact he is only a wage slave. He believes he enjoys the liberty for the pursuit of happiness while his days, weeks, years, and his whole life are mortgaged to the boss in the mine or factory. The people under a tyranny know they are enslaved, and sometimes they revolt. The people in America are in bondage and don't know it. That is why there are no revolutions in America. Modern capitalism is wise. It knows that it prospers best under democratic institutions with the people electing their own representatives to the lawmaking bodies and indirectly casting their vote even for the president. The capitalist masters do not care for how or for whom you vote, whether it be Republican or the Democratic ticket. What is the difference to them who you elect? He will, be, he will legislate in favor of law and order to protect things the way they are. The main concern of the powers that be is that the people should continue to believe and uphold the existing system. That is why they spend millions for the schools, colleges, and universities which educate you to believe in capitalism and their government. Politics and politicians, governors and lawmakers, are only their puppets. They will see to it that no legislation is passed against their interests. Now and then, they will make a show of fighting certain laws and favoring others, else a game would lose its interest for you. But whatever laws there be, the masters will take care that it shouldn't hurt their interests, and that their well-paid lawyers know how to turn every law to the benefit of big interests, as daily experience proves. A very striking illustration of it is the famous Sherman Antitrust Law. Organized labor spent thousands of dollars and years of energy to pass that legislation. 
it was directed against the growing capitalist monopoly, against the powerful combinations of money which ruled legislatures and courts, and lorded it over the workers with an iron hand. After long and expensive effort, the Sherman Law was at last passed, and labor leaders and politicians were jubilant over the new epoch created by that law as they enthusiastically insured the toilers. But what has that law accomplished? The trusts have not been hurt by it. They have remained safe and sound. In fact, they have grown and multiplied. They dominate the country and treat workers as, ad, as abject slaves. They are more powerful and prosperous, prosperous than ever before. But one important thing the Sherman Law did accomplish, passed especially in the interests of labor, it has been turned against the workers and their unions. It is now used to break up organizations of labor as being prevention of free competition. The labor unions are now constantly menaced by the anti -tr that antitrust law, while capitalistic trusts go on their way undisturbed. My friend, do I need to tell you that the bribery and debauchery of politics, about the corruption of the courts, about the vile administration of justice, do I need to remind you of the big teapot dome and oil lease scandals and the thousands of other lesser ones of everyday occurrence? It would be an insult to your intelligence to dwell upon these universally known things, for they are part and parcel of all politics in every country. The great evil is not that the politicians are corrupt and the administration of law unjust. If that were the only trouble, then we might try, like the, if, like the reformer, to purify politics and to work for more just administration. But that is not which is the real trouble. The trouble is not with politics, but that the whole game is po of politics is rotten. The trouble is not with the defects in the administration of law, but the law itself is an instrument to subject and oppress the people. The whole system of law and government is a machine that keeps the workers enslaved and robs them of their toil. Every social reform whose realization depends on law and government is already thereby doomed to failure. But the union exclaims your friend, the labor union is the best defense of the worker. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.